So we thank God for them, and we certainly want to celebrate. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31, the New King James, it says, By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. I want to speak into your life today the characteristics of saving faith. Saving faith, the characteristics. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. It's so vital, so important, amen, that we come together for the hearing of God's word. And um, it increases our faith. And we've been talking about faith, amen, ministering about faith. And, uh, and so the Lord took us, amen, that way even today. This is an interesting story because if you would just look at Hebrews 11.31 without knowing the full story behind this, you would say, wow, amen. It just shows you the, the grace and the mercy of God that there is a harlot, amen, who received spies and yet she was saved. You would have to know and build the story around that to really get an understanding of that. And that story is devoted really to a, almost a full chapter here in Joshua chapter 2. Amen. How many of you know the story of Rahab the harlot? Amen. All right. And some of you don't. Some will say, I don't know any story about any prostitute. Amen. <laughs> well, you're going to find out about this one today. Amen. And the comedy starts. Ah, hallelujah. Rahab is mentioned as someone who has a faith in God and is listed here in Hebrews 11 in one of the heroes of faith, really. God specifically points to her and many others, but specifically points to her about her amazing faith to let us know what faith looks like. Amen. She is someone who had faith in God. And, and because of her faith in God, it led to really her salvation, as you will see here as we go on. Salvation, of course, as we mentioned last Sunday, is based on faith and having a saving faith in Jesus Christ who paid the price for our salvation. Amen. So we're going to see some characteristics in our story today of what faith looks like and how to apply it to our lives. This is not just uh, about salvation for our soul. Anything you need in your life that needs saving you can apply these characteristics. As you look at the background of her life, for those who don't know the story, and to remind those of you who do, Rahab, as you see here, was a harlot, the scripture says. She was a prostitute. Amen. And so we probably don't need to go into a whole lot of detail there, but she did sexual favors for money. She had no problem selling her body for money. And really, when I was looking at that, I said, isn't this really the root of all sin? Amen. How many sinners do we have in here? Amen. Have had sin in their life? Amen. Well, some of you didn't raise your hand because I'm, I'm tying in a prostitute to a sinner. But the root of it is the same, right? Notice a, you prostitute yourself. When you use something that God gave you and put in you for the pleasure of sin. I'll see now we all are prostitutes when you use that definition, right? And so anything that you do just for money, for recognition, or prestige, it can be a way of prostituting yourself. We wouldn't use that word today. We would say and call somebody who does that a sellout. Right? They, they're a sellout. They, they gave up for the cause to have something else, for something selfish. They, they were someone on the team who we were counting on, but they, they were a sellout and, and didn't give their all. They didn't come ready and prepare. They, they sold us out. And so let me give you this example. Amen. Let's, let's look at how God made men. Right. God made men, amen, to take care of, to protect, to provide. 
And so a family man is someone who will take care of his children, amen, look after and care for his wife, amen. But a sellout in that area would be a man who has a wife and children but isn't around much, doesn't provide, and still wants to live the single life. Mm. We could say that that man then is a sellout. My God, he has prostituted his position and value as a man, amen, and prostituted his influence that God has given him to lead his family for the purpose of selfish pleasure. Y'all understand what I'm talking about now? So this harlot, Rahab, she served the gods of the Amorites and the Canaanites. She lived in a town called Jericho. And so as Israel was left Egypt, and now they're getting ready to go into the promised land that God had promised them, amen, the first city they're going to have to conquer is Jericho. And so this is where Rahab lived. And interesting enough, amen, she lived on the wall of the city. Jericho was known for their wall that went all the way around the city. It was a way to provide protection and also a way to try and keep the enemy out from any invasion. It is said that the wall was six feet wide, a very thick wall. And it was about 13 feet high, but it also had towers on the wall that rose as high as 28 feet. We see here then that she lived in this environment. And she lived, amen, serving the gods of the Amorites and the Canaanites because the inhabitants of Jericho were a mixed group, but none of them served the Almighty God. They served false gods. And so their gods, false gods, idol gods, were usually gods that were, they considered them a god over just a small particular area of their life. If they wanted rain, they worshiped the rain god. If they wanted success in their hunting, they worshiped the hunting god. If, amen, they, they needed, amen, and wanted children, they worshiped the fertility god. If they went to war, they would worship the war god and, and so forth. And even things that would bring them concern and even fear, they would worship a god to hold that down. Like, for instance, they even had a thunder god to calm the thunder. Well, her house was built on this wall. Amen, which means that it was perfect for people who were just passing by, amen, to be able to see her house, which if you're going to be a harlot, don't you want to be on the wall of the city? So this woman was smart. She was strategic in everything that she did in order for her to have customers. She wanted to be visible to those who were passing by. Amen. Amen. But she had some amazing characteristics about her that led to her saving faith in God. I'm going to give you the four now, and then we're going to minister on them. Number one, she had faith in the true God that can do all things. And we're going to see how she did that. Second, she had faith to ask for salvation. Now, we brought up the ass last week, but, amen, we see that she had the same characteristic, amen, to ask for salvation. Number three, she had faith to help those who were connected to God. And four, she had faith to believe that a scarlet cord would save her. And so we're going to break that down so you'll understand it as we go. If we go to Joshua chapter 2, we're going to do a little bit of reading here. I can read fast. Joshua chapter 2, notice the story here. In verse 1 it says, Now Joshua the son of Nun went out two men from, a, from the Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So Joshua here sends two spies. He says, I want you to go spy the land, especially Jericho, because that's going to be the first town, the first city that we are going to have to conquer to have and to take the promised land that God gave us. So these two spies, it says, and so they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. Now I often wonder, okay, spies, what was that about? 
Amen. But before your mind goes into the gutter, please understand this, is that they didn't want to get caught. So what happened was is that uh, Joshua told him, make sure you really check out Jericho. Which means if you're really going to check out Jericho, how they're fortified, how big their army is, you got to get on the inside of the walls. And how they did that is they say, oh, we'll go to that prostitute's house so we can get on the inside. Doesn't mean that they were going to do anything with her. They just wanted to get on the inside so they could really spy. Verse 2, and it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. Which lets me know that the king of Jericho had spies out there also to see who came into the land because they heard about the God of Israel. And so, amen, it's reported to him that there's two men from Israel that are hanging out at Rahab's house. So the king of Jericho in verse 3 sent to Rahab saying, Bring out those men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. In other words, girl, we know you got spies in there. Bring the spies out. Verse 4, then the woman took the two men and hid them. Here is the threat of her possibly losing her life. Amen. This is her king in Jericho. Amen. These are her people. But she hides the two spies. And she said, yes, the men came to me, but I, I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men left. They went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Go after them quickly. Pursue them, for you may catch them. You may overtake them. Ah. This is an interesting scripture to me because scripture tells us that we are not supposed to lie. But there seems to be an exception here when it comes to protecting God's people. Uh, I hope I just didn't open the door for everyone to tell stories now. In the name of the Lord, I had to tell a lie, Pastor. Watch this, verse 6. But she had brought them up to the roof. And hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order on the roof. So stalks of flax were like these four-foot reeds. Amen. And they would take them, pluck them out of the marshes and stuff, and they would lay them on the roof to dry. And what happened is the reeds had a fiber in them. And so when they dried out, they could use it to make linen and material for clothing and, and things like that. So, amen, it's pretty good. You got four feet bundles of reeds, amen. She just laid the spies there and covered them up. Rahab, Rahab was sharp. She was slick. <laughs> then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as Oh pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So they believed her. They believed her when, amen, she says, amen, no, nah, uh, uh when they shut the gate and it got dark, they left. You should go after them. Maybe you can catch them. It wasn't that long ago. And they bought her story. My God. And so we see here that it has something to do with her faith in helping God's people. And we're going to get to that again in a little bit, of, in a little bit here. First of all, we're going to see here in verse 8 through 11 that she had faith in the God who can do all things. You got to think about her life. She had all these different gods, and, and I'm sure she prayed and worshiped, and they gave offerings to all these different gods, but these gods never did anything. And I'm sure she wondered about that. And so now, though, she caught wind. She heard about the God of Israel. Verse 8. Now before they laid down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, Now I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Now she heard some stories, probably through travelers, right? Probably through men who came by for some business. She heard about, amen, this God of Israel and this nation is on the move and God has given them this land. 
And here you are, you live in a city, amen, that's right on the border of the land that she heard that God was going to give Israel. But watch this. She believed in the God of Israel. She heard this and she heard the stories about this God. Verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. She heard that these two kings who had massive armies, amen, they wouldn't let Israel pass through their territory, amen, so that left God to go ahead and just conquer them. But you got to understand, Israel, they weren't built to be fighters. They weren't built to be an army, and their army was small that they did have. But God wiped them out anyway. God took care of business for his people anyway, and she heard about this. How is it that your God could wipe out the the strongest armies of our land? My God. So she heard about it. She heard about the Red Sea opening up. There's people today. Amen. There's, There's even people who believe in God today that believe the Red Sea opening is a fairy tale. I'm here to tell you, if the scripture says God opened up the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land, that's exactly what happened because there's nothing too hard for God. Your God destroys. Your God opens Red Seas. Your God set you free from the Egyptian army. Verse 11, as soon as we heard these things, our heart melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. You see, this is why you have to understand that your testimony is so important. That you got to tell the stories of what God has done for you. You have the testimony about salvation, but you have testimonies all along the way how God has kept you and protected you and, amen, and watched over you and, and, and has keep forgiving you and keeps forgiving you and, and all of that, amen, because when you tell those stories, trust me, people like to talk and they will tell the stories too, even if they say it sarcastically, amen. Hey, did you hear the story about Mark? What? What did you hear about Mark? Man, he's pastoring now. Really? That party goer? That drunk? I don't believe it. Yeah, man, him. He, yeah, he says he hasn't been drunk since, amen, God took over his life. Nah, I don't believe it. But here's what God will do with your testimony. He'll begin to work on people. Amen. And now they check Mark out on the internet and realize, wait a minute, that's a different guy now. That's a different dude. Your testimony, and even if people give it sarcastically and negatively, amen, still proves God to be true. That he's a powerful God who can do all things. But she said... When I saw everybody get afraid and lose their courage, amen, I believe your God is God. She's telling the spies, your God is the God. He's the God of the heaven above. He's the God of everything that's going on in earth. Point number two then, she had faith to ask for salvation. She knows if this God and this Israeli army are coming to wipe out Jericho, you know what? Let me, let me see what's getting ready to happen and see if there's a way I can be saved. Amen. That's important to understand. Do you, see, do you see that this world is headed for destruction? You need to ask God right now, Lord, how can I be saved from this world and all its evil? Verse 12, now therefore, she says, I beg you. Swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house. And give me a true token. I need a true token. I don't don't just need your lip service. But I need a true token 
that you'll spare my father, you'll spare my mother, you'll spare my brothers, you'll spare my sisters and all that they have and deliver all of our lives from death. Here's, here's what I love about Rahab is that she wasn't just thinking about herself. She was thinking about her family. I want you to know today that your salvation has an effect in your family, your family line, and future generation. And not just about your soul. God is after everybody. Notice the scripture says that she begged them. Amen. She says, save me, I beg you. That's called being poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is having a humble heart and understanding this. Here's the poor part, that this is something I can't do for myself. But God, you can. So God, I'm coming to you because I'm helpless without you. I'm, I'm broke in this area. I'm poor in this area. I'm, I'm a beggar in this area. Lord, please, she says, please save us. Amen. Here's what being poor in spirit is, is, amen, asking for God for something you can't do by yourself. You see, now, people know they can't do stuff by themselves, but they still try. You ain't poor in spirit yet. But when that fails, and the next one fails, and the next one fails, and you are so broken down, and you're tired of trying to run everything by yourself, you'll get there. You'll get there. I, got, I just give up. I just give up. Lord, I'm yours. I can't do this. Let's be real. We're not very good at being bosses of our own lives. You might as well turn it over to the Lord of Lords and let him be the boss of your life. But humility before God is necessary before you will ask God to save you from anything. She's saying, save all my family and save us from death. My God, we need to be saved. Now, what I love about her is, you know, obviously this girl's smart, but she also has street smarts, right? And she says, please do this for me since, you know, I just saved your life, right? I just showed you some kind. She didn't go that deep. She's smart. She says, since I showed you some kindness, she saved their lives. Amen. Perhaps the greatest thing we can see about her saving faith here is this, that we can learn from her, is that we need saving from prostituting ourselves from sin. We need saving for the, pur saving for the purpose and situations and circumstances that happen in life. We, we need saving from having an unforgiving spirit because someone did you wrong and you're trying to hold on to that. We need saving from sickness and saving from disease and saving from anxiety and we need to be saved from stress. Amen. It's okay to cry out to God and say, Jesus, I need you to save me and my family. That's honoring to God, and it speaks of your faith when you get outside of yourself and know that you are the God that can do all things. So save me, touch me, help me, and everyone associated to me. Mm. So here, here where we get to point number three, faith helps those who are connected to God. Now, she already did this, as we see, by by hiding, amen, the spies and, and sending those that tried to get them, lied to them and get them out of here, amen. But that's what faith does. Faith sees something bigger than themselves. She is, amen, helping those who are connected to God. Now, she's not saved yet, right? There's still a salvation plan coming in this story, but, amen, here's what faith is. She already knows that I am saved because I help these who are connected to the God I believe in. So the men answered her when she gave her request in verse 14 of Joshua 2. The men answered her and says, our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, we will deal kindly and truly with you. My God. I love that law. That's a law. That's a law of the street, too. 
You do me right, I do you right. But just as soon as, just as soon as you stab me in the back, you're done. That's what they were saying to her. Because they don't know Rahab. They know her occupation, but they know this girl, you know, she can lie people away. She's sharp. She knows what she's doing. Verses in, then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall. She helped them escape. I'm sure she told them all about Jericho, what it was like. So, amen. She, they went to the perfect person to find out everything that's going on. Amen. And so they spied out the land, and she lets them down. But remember, she sent those that are after these men out there to try and find them, and now she lets them down. So notice verse 16. And she said, now quickly go to the mountain, and lest the pursuers meet you. Just hide in the mountain three days, and when they have returned after, go your way. She even gave them the plan. She knew, amen, by being on the wall, seeing everything that comes in and goes out, she knew how they operate. They're going to go on about a three-day journey. They always do. And when they can't find nothing, they're going to come back. So go hide in the mountain three days, amen, and then you're going to be clear to just go your way. <laughs> Notice what she's doing. She's helping them. My God, they're, they're, that is such an important characteristic and principle about faith in God. Amen. She helped hide them. She covered them. Amen. She provided the rope for them to escape. Amen. And then she gives them a plan of escape. She don't even know God yet, but she has faith in this God. So anyone attached to God, I know that if I bless them, God will bless me. You see, that's, that's having a love in God already. That if God saved you, amen, and he loves you, amen, then let me show my love to God by being a blessing to those that God loves. You see, when we help one another, when we help each other in the body of Christ, your brothers and your sisters in the Lord, it is an act of faith because we're all connected to God. God will bless you individually, amen, when you put others first. When you love your neighbor as you love yourself, when you put yourself in someone else's shoes and said, if that was me, I would need some help, so let me help somebody. God gives you spiritual gifts to help others, to institute faith in others like I'm doing right now. Amen. To give people mercy, to give them encouragement. Amen. To use your gift of healing to lay hands on people. Whatever your gift is, use it. It's made for you to give it out to God's people. Your service. Amen. To help others. Amen. Most of the things that happen, amen, in this body of Christ requires us, amen, to have volunteers, we call them. Amen. They just do it because they love God and they love God's people and they give time in their life, amen, and pour in, amen. Why? Because they know that's where their blessing is. My God. And you're giving. Yes, your giving and tithes and offerings is helping one another, amen, to be a blessing, amen. I tell you this, I can't afford the mortgage payment by myself, amen. But when we all put our part in, amen, guess what? We never miss the mortgage payment because everyone's doing their part for the benefit of one another. Hallelujah, amen. We're sitting in these beautiful chairs on this nice carpet, amen, in this air-conditioned room because everyone is giving for the benefit of someone else. And our fourth point is this, is she had faith in the scarlet cord. So watch this. Notice what the men said to her in verse 17. So the men said to her, we'll be blameless of this oath of yours but you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father and your mother and your brothers and sisters and all your father's household to your home. Here's the plan. She says, have, when we come to invade this city, 
You need to have all your family under your roof. And you need to take this scarlet cord and you need to hang it in your window. Scarlet cord is a red cord. Amen. And, and I love this. So she says, amen. The very way you gave us escape is how you're going to be saved. So when we come to invade this, if we see this red thread hanging inside your window, we'll save everybody who's under the roof with you. Uh. But if we don't see the cord, the red scarlet cord, amen, you'll be like everybody else and get killed. My God. So here's where she had faith. She had faith in the scarlet cord. Here's what, here's what faith does. Faith doesn't question the instructions of God. All she knows is I want to be saved. And I want my family saved. Amen. When people have a problem with the plan of salvation, you don't want to be saved. You're looking for a religious argument. Amen. Notice she didn't question, well, what does that thread have to do with it? Why does it got to be red? Why does that? You know how people are. You ain't ready. You know I, mean? I know when I got saved, they could have told me anything. I didn't know the Bible. Just tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. But I was praying about this, amen, and I was thinking about why the spies said this. Well, first of all, this is how they were saved, so this is how you're going to be saved. But watch this. The scripture says, amen, that the scarlet cord must be in the window. Amen. It wasn't to be outside the window. See, some of us will say, well, I'm going to make sure. I'm going to get about 15 of them, and I'm going to put them all over the place. You'll draw too much attention from the enemy. Amen. God don't need all that. He just needs to see a little bit of the red in the window. You see, windows are important to look out, but windows are also a way that you can look in. And so what they're saying is, and what I'm saying is this, is that when someone looks into your heart, do they see the scarlet cord? Do they see the application of Jesus Christ? Amen. Do they see someone who is saved by the blood of the Lamb? You see, the scarlet cord represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember when they were in Egypt, it was the blood around the doorpost and the top. Amen. That when the death angel came, but when the, the, they saw the blood all the way around the door, that death angel passed over and everybody in that house was saved. When judgment comes to this world, you better make sure you have the blood of Jesus applied to you. My God. But the scarlet cord is, is interesting because they didn't have dyes in those days like we do. They, to, to get a red color on a material took some work. And, and what they did is there is a specific type of worm, amen, that uh, is there. And, and so what happens is this worm, amen, as it's going through a process, I'm going to talk about it here in the middle, in a minute, amen, they'll harvest this worm when it has attached itself to a tree, amen, and they'll harvest this worm, amen, and they will crush it and boil it in hot water, and it produces a red dye. They take that red dye then, and they use it to dye material and to dye thread, Amen. So, so it's interesting that it takes a worm in order for it to have a red color, my God. But we know that the red represents the blood. In Psalms 22 and 6, it's a messianic psalm, and, and, amen, and Jesus quoted it while he was on the cross even. My God, my God. Why has thou forsaken me? But in Psalms 22 and 6, as it relates to Christ on the cross, it says this. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. Now, when you look at worm in the Hebrew text, 
there are at least two worms that are mentioned. Job talked about himself as a worm, but in that word, rima, it, it talks about him being a maggot. But in this prophetic psalm that really speaks of Christ, amen, the, the word worm there is a tolat at. And the tolat at talks about this worm that had to go through a process in the birth of having offspring or other worms. And so here's what would happen. Amen. When this, this female worm was ready to give birth, she would climb a tree. And as she climbed up the tree, she would attach herself permanently to the tree. In other words, this worm ingrained itself into the tree, and then it produced a hard crimson shell. The, the shell would actually now turn red. Amen. And watch this. She was so permanently attached, amen, to this tree with her body, amen, that you really couldn't tear the two apart. That's how ingrained she was in the tree. And then she would lay her eggs, hatch her eggs, amen, and she would still be there to cover them and protect them and actually create a red shell around them to protect them as the larvae is growing, amen. And then watch this. And then they begin to eat her body. The only food they have was the food of the worm, the mother worm. So they began to eat on her living body. Eventually, as they are mature enough, the mother dies. And the mother, amen, falls down off the tree after about three days. And amen. And then before that happens, though, her redness about her stains Amen. The other baby worms. And they now are stained with the crimson red color for the rest of their lives. After the three days when the worm, amen, would fall to the ground, watch this, and gave all of its red, it says that the worm turns white wax, white as snow, and falls to the ground. It gave its life for the offspring. So it's during this time that, amen, just before that would happen, what they do in Israel, amen, is they harvest these worms. They harvest them when they're at the, the point of the maximum crimson redness, amen. Bill, can you show that one just to give us an idea? You see the redness on that tree? First, you can see the redness of the worm as it, as it creates a cocoon, but you see the redness of that tree? Watch this. Jesus attached himself to the tree for us. And he shed his blood for us and spilled all his blood for our protection. Amen. Amen. His blood was, amen, nailed to the cross, so he was ingrained in the cross. Amen. When Jesus carried the cross, he hugged the cross. He embraced the cross because the cross meant our salvation. Amen. He was the crimson worm. Amen. So that we who are the maggot worms could become his worm. Amen. And live forever. He gave his life just like that worm does. Amen. For the babies to have life. He gave his life so that we would have life. And if you're saved today, my God, you are stained by the blood of Jesus. If you haven't been around church and don't understand blood, I know we can say some crazy things. Amen. How you doing, Pastor? I'm covered by the blood. Someone ever heard that before? He's covered by the blood. What? I'm getting out of this place. This place is crazy. No, but when you understand... That the shed blood of Jesus Christ, amen, has stained us and covered us and protects us, amen, and takes care of all our sin. You don't have any problem saying I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. And then Jesus, on the third day, he rose from the grave. And when they saw him, he was gleaning in white, white as snow. 
Hallelujah. Even Jesus, my God, Jesus even said to his disciples, watch this. He said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Those, those little worms had to eat, amen, the body of their mother in order for them to have life. The reason we didn't serve communion today because you thought, uh-oh, we're going to eat worms. No, we're not. But what it says is, is that we're still feeding. So when we do take communion, we're taking in life. We're taking in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us life. It helps us to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Just like this, amen, tola, worm, gives its life for the other worms. It is from that worm that you get the red, crimson color of the thread. I believe, amen, that there must have been some type of a revelation or something, amen, that, that Rahab had, amen, so she put all that she had in her request to be saved, she put it in that scarlet cord. She believed this scarlet cord based on the messengers, the spies, the messengers that told her, unless you put this thing in the window. She wanted to make sure that when anybody looks in my window, I am covered by the scarlet thread. When anybody looks in your window, do they, do they see the effects of the blood of Jesus in your life? She had faith in the blood. She heard about the Passover in Egypt. Notice verse 19. We're coming to a close. So it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and will be guiltless, the spies told her. But whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you have made us swear. In other words, the spies are saying to them, to, to, to Rahab, stay with the scarlet cord. Stay with the covering of the blood. I love verse 21 because then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. This was her action of faith. She didn't just hear it and didn't do it. She heard it and applied it immediately. She looked at that cord and said, this is what's going to save me. This is what's going to keep me free. When they see this cord in my window, amen, everybody with me is going to be saved. She had faith in the scarlet cord. She applied it permanently to her life. My God. Hallelujah. And so that, amen, is, is understanding what Jesus did for us. Amen, is, is the characteristics of saving faith. You can't be saved any other way except through the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. Hallelujah. And so if God has to show that to you, amen, through nature, if he has to show it to you through a worm, amen, but however God has to get it to you so you get it, that's exactly what God wants. So you will believe in him for saving faith. And, of course, when they came to take out Jericho, they saw the scarlet thread. We'll just read these three scriptures and then we're done. Joshua 6, 22 through 25. Joshua said to the two men who spied out the country, go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all of her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the city and all that was with it with fire, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron, they put that into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, all that she had. And so she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers from Joshua who sent out to spy out Jericho. The characteristics of her faith saved her and all her family. 
Now, in case you don't know it, Rahab ends up becoming the great-great-grandmother of King David. And in case you don't know it, in the Gospels, where we see the lineage of Jesus Christ, guess who's in the lineage? Rahab the harlot. It's like Jesus says, yeah, I came from a prostitute. A prostitute is in my family line, but, but she believed in the blood that I shed. Amen. So I cleaned her up, and I gave her and set her up in a position of prestige. She's one of the great, 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 I don't know how many far down the line, grandmothers of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've got a uh, prostitute in your family line, you probably don't even mention her. But Jesus had no problem. Why? Because she had saving faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. I ask you this, what do you need to ask for God? What do you need to ask him today? What is your need? What area of your life needs saving? What area of your life needs the blood applied? Now, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's just coming down and asking him to save you. Make him the boss of your life. Say, Lord, you take control. That's all repentance is. Amen. You can be baptized in his name for the remission of sins and take on the family name. Amen. And he'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you're here today and you don't have, amen, the Holy Spirit fully activated in your life, you can come forward in this altar call also. Amen. I don't want anybody to leave, amen, early today because as we come around for offering, amen, amen, I got a scarlet cord for each and every one of you. Amen. So you can hang it somewhere to remind you of how good God has been to you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So let us stand right now. Amen. Ministers, come forward. Altar workers who are also ministers, come forward. Amen. We have prayed over, amen, this message. We have prayed over the, the scarlet cords we're going to give you today. Amen. But now God wants, amen, his anointed to pray over you. So come on forward. There's nothing, amen, too big or too small as you can ask God for. Hallelujah. Amen. But let him apply, amen, the life-giving blood of his life to any situation or circumstance in your life. Hallelujah. I believe. Hey, Moshi Arabasa. Oh, Hallelujah. I believe that all things are possible. Nothing is impossible.
Anybody else? If not, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Do your work, Jesus. Do your work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus was the worm for you? Hallelujah. That shed his blood and gave his life that we would have life. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Our God, let's just give him thanks right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He deserves our praise, he deserves our worship. 
Hallelujah. You've been stained by the crimson blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Once he applies his blood, oh, he makes us white as snow. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you Jesus. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Lord. We honor you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The crimson red dye of that worm is so strong that it becomes permanent. Watch this. There's another scripture that says that though your sins be as scarlet, in other words, sin, amen, stains you that you can't get out by yourself. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Hallelujah. Only Jesus, only Jesus, hallelujah, can make you white as snow. You may think, Pastor, you don't know what I've done. I get it. It's a stain. Amen. You don't know how to get rid of it. Hallelujah. But none of us can get rid of our sin stains. Hallelujah. We need a Savior. And only by the blood of Jesus can you be made white as snow. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the blood. Hallelujah. Go ahead and show the announcements, Bill. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Lord, I thank you. Good morning, North Park. We hope that you have enjoyed the service today and that your soul has been filled and your spirit has been lifted. Here are your announcements for the week. The Missourias Going Away Cookout, Saturday, August 17th, from 12 noon to 4 p.m., right here in the North Park parking lot. We are asking all that attend to please park on the street. We have reserved our back parking lot for our handicapped members and seniors. We will supply chicken, hamburgers, hot dogs, hot links, tacos, potato chips, and bottled water. Please feel free to bring your own sides and soda and even your favorite folding chair. Activities for the day. Inflatable jumper for the kids, basketball, board games, card games, dominoes, and so much more. Again, that is Saturday, August the 17th, here in the North Park parking lot from 12 noon to 4 p.m. You want to be there. Well, those are your announcements for the week. Please govern yourselves accordingly. Remember to love God, love others, serve others, and share the gospel. Amen. Can you thank God for the word again today? Amen. Are you thankful for the blood? My, my, my. Hallelujah to God. Don't believe I've ever heard it on that wise before. My God. Amen. That's some word, good word there. Amen. You need to keep that in your spirit. Amen. Keep that in your spirit. That's some good stuff that God has delivered unto us today. Amen. Listen, we're getting ready to uh, dismiss you here in a minute and receive our offering, but we want to uh, greet all our guests. We have some guest cards here. We want to make mention of your name here. And it's good to have uh, Demetria with us. You go by Blue, I believe. Where are you at? Bless you. Amen. Glad to have you today. Amen. It's also good to have, I believe it's three, uh, all three kids, or kids, I guess. Abdul, Ishmael, and Cher. 
All right. Back there. All right. Bless you all. Amen. A good with Anita Monroe, I believe it is. Amen. Bless you. Amen. Glad to have you as well. Amen. And all of you that are online, God bless you. We're glad that you joined us today as well. Amen. You ready to give? Let's all stand. We're going to pray a dismissal prayer over you and pray over the offering. And don't forget your scarlet ribbons as you come around and receive. Amen. This will remind you of what we've heard today. Amen. Amen. Lord, we love you today. We're so thankful, God, for the word that's come forth, oh God. Lord, we pray your spirit would keep it in our minds and our hearts, oh God, of glory. Lord, I pray your spirit would go and be with everyone that's been in this place today, oh God. Lord, we believe you for great things, oh God, this coming week, oh God. Keep your hand upon your mighty people, O oh God, for we love you so dearly, O oh God. We ask your blessings upon us, offering, my God, it's used for your kingdom's sake. Bless it and multiply it for your kingdom work, O oh God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you today. We love you much.